Today is Tuesday in the 18th week of Ordinary Time, and we're presented today with two readings that begin with sorrow and end in hope. I'd like to reflect on these biblical messages of hope, especially when we find ourselves in periods of difficulty or even despair. For many of us, the beautiful summer sun, fresh flowers, and warmth could in fact be a backdrop to deep pain, loneliness, anxiety, and confusion. In this reflection, I also want to emphasize that the biblical message of hope is not merely a collection of nice and comforting words. This ancient wisdom offers us a plan of action because clarity in our discernment comes from engagement with life, not from merely thinking about it. Our first reading from Jeremiah sets the stage. Incurable is your wound, grievous your bruise. There is none to plead your cause, no remedy for your running sore, no healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you, they do not seek you. I struck you as an enemy would strike, punished you cruelly. Why cry out over your wound? Your pain is without relief. Because of your great guilt, your numerous sins, I have done this to you. While I wish these words would not resonate with anyone today, I'm sure that's not the case. Do you find yourself today in a situation that seems incurable, without remedy? Do you feel forgotten, painfully alone, forced to face the trials of life yourself? The Jeremiah text asserts, because of your sins, I have done this. Sadly, it has become a common notion in Christianity to believe that God inflicts suffering upon us as a punishment for our sins. If, like me, you're following the current season of the British mystery drama Grandchester, uh, Mrs. C, one of the characters, believes that she has been inflicted with a serious illness as divine punishment for the sins of her youth. Now, this is a common view, but it's simply not what we as Christians profess to believe. The numerous sins identified by Jeremiah are more likely social sins, which our catechism presents as social situations and institutions that are contrary to divine goodness. These structures emerge out of our personal vices as well as our collective disregard for human dignity of others. Jeremiah, Isaiah, and the other prophets had a simple message. What God requires is for us to maintain justice and show mercy. When we act with justice and mercy, the prophecy changes from sorrow to hope. See, I will restore the tents of Jacob, his dwellings I will pity. Cities shall be rebuilt upon hill and palace restored as it was. From them will resound songs of praise. Chapters 30 to 33 of Jeremiah are referred to as the Book of Consolation because they contain messages of hope and comfort concerning the future. Jeremiah was a real person, a historical figure who lived during the late 7th century BC. However, while Jeremiah was a historical figure, more importantly he is, in the words of Professor Michael Coogan, a literary character who personifies the suffering of the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem during the final years of the Davidic monarchy. Jeremiah was living in challenging times. Let's note that despite the challenges that Jeremiah faced in his lifetime, the authors of the book of Jeremiah were probably writing later and interpreting terrible events in light of their faith and their hope in a God of justice and mercy. Nearly six centuries later, the writers of Matthew's gospel made a similar move. In today's passage, the apostles find themselves trapped on a boat at night in the middle of a storm. The text says, Jesus came toward them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. 
At once Jesus spoke to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Like Jeremiah, his words are a message of hope. For Peter, however, these words were not enough. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. But when Peter saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. I wonder how Peter was feeling when he said, Lord, if it is you, command me. For me, it's like hearing this gospel or the words of Jeremiah and asking if this message is for real, especially if we feel alone, abandoned, punished, and incurable. The words of comfort, take courage, do not be afraid, may ring hollow. Perhaps more important than the storm at sea or Peter's faith, pay attention to the final lines of today's gospel. After making the crossing, they came to land at Gennesaret. When the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought to him all those who were sick and begged him that they might touch only the tassel of his cloak, and as many as touched it were healed. The people at Gennesaret did not say, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. Rather, they brought him those who were sick. They brought their suffering and despair directly to Jesus. The importance of these readings today seems less about hopeful words and comforting sentiments, but rather about a spiritual directive, a call to action. Bring your suffering, your fear, anxiety, and confusion to God in prayer. Ask for clarification of thought. Pray for meaning and guidance. Pray for the path forward. And what might we find in this prayer? An answer can be found in the words of Thomas Merton. An awakening, enlightenment, and the amazing intuitive grasp by which love gains certitude of God's creative and dynamic intervention in our daily life.